Welcome everybody to this week's C-Mask podcast and we're talking about why men should ignore the marriage black pill. You don't have to spend much time online or talking to young guys today to hear things like men in their 20s should get a vasectomy and forget all about marriage mm. because marriage is for simps and guys who want to get financially ruined by divorce courts. So why would you bother? And when you talk to these people, you can pretty much get a stopwatch out and just start counting down the seconds before they explain. And you see, that's why I'm just going to have to fornicate. That's where the argument normally ends up. So today is all about marriage, celibacy, or degeneracy. What is the path for young men today? Those are your only options. There's no fourth way. Marriage, celibacy, degeneracy. So let's get straight into the top 12 lies about marriage making men weak. And we've got the right crew for it today because this is really the last laugh of feminism. Men thinking that there's no point even stepping foot on the battlefield of marriage and the family for the future of civilization because they're broken on the inside. They don't even want to try. So we've got number one, most marriages end in divorce. This is probably the thing I hear parroted most of all. Thomas Sowell has a great point about this in his book, Dismantling America. He talks about how the stats are twisted to create despair. He says it is completely misleading to compare all the divorces in one year from marriages begun years and even decades earlier with the number of marriages begun in that one year. So if you look at the Institute for Family Studies, you'll see that actually the divorce rate in the US is at an all-time low. Around 14.9 in every thousand marriages end in divorce. But let's say for the sake of argument that the divorce rate was high. Would that be enough to put any of you off getting married? Elliot, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I tend to be a rebellious dude, and counterculture is my way. By the way, if, I, if I'm frozen, let me know. Um, and I hate more than anything being manipulated or the sense that I'm being manipulated. And if, if everybody's rejecting marriage and everybody's turning it away and turning down and saying bad things about it, to me, the red flag goes up and says, wait a second, there must be something there that's, that's hidden. There must be some lie that's being unfolded. And so I went into that thing where, you know, one of my mentors would say, if all the, if everybody's going one way, you got to turn around and go the opposite way. So just from that rebellious standpoint, just from the standpoint of like, look, if the culture is about it, I'm not, I, if I was a young man, I'd be looking into marriage. And I think, you know, that's the, that's, that's the punk rock attitude of today, right? Like in the eighties, it was all like, you know, piercings and tattoos and Mohawks, I guess. And now I see like the re the rebellious young people are the ones that are saying no to cutting off their genitals and yes to procreating and getting married and doing things a traditional way. So if you want to be one of the cool kids, right? You want to be actually different, not just what young people say is different. Yeah, for most people, when they say they try to be different, it just means, no, you're just being the same. Being, being, being the same by being different and following the pop culture narrative. Uh, be a rebel. Be a cool kid. Go get married and have lots of babies. That's great advice. It takes strength to swim against the stream of degeneracy that is threatening to just sweep you off your feet and take you along with it. This is exactly what happened in falling Rome as well. How come the Christians were able to stand strong and rise from its ashes? Because when everyone else around them was falling prey to sexual degeneracy, they kept marriage as the standard and they behaved themselves basically. And then that's what through fertility, create strong families, strong societies. Tim, it's interesting, isn't it, that there are so many guys thinking that marriage is a lost cause and a black pill about it, because this is exactly what the enemies of patriarchy want them to believe, right? Absolutely. It's a full circle. 
between feminism and the red pill when we examine the ideological fixture of marriage. They're saying the self-same thing. I don't think intentionally, because the red pill is saying legitimately different, different stuff on almost everything else, except on degeneracy in the place of marriage. They're the exact same there, and that happens to be the most important issue. Most young men are actually just being plain lied to about the divorce rate. I don't know if you guys have seen this on in the drama between Pearl and the Daily Wire, but it's played out such that um, the, the guys like Rolo Tomasi are responding to Pearl versus the Daily Wire. I, I like a lot of the stuff Pearl said, as you guys know. I'm going on her show on a panel on Tuesday. But I don't like what she's saying about marriage, which is essentially just what Rolo Tomasi et al. say. And they have this lawyer, divorce lawyer, sound like a grift, that they keep pulling up for the Rolo uh, debate panel review uh, boards and stuff like that. His name is James Sexton. And he's saying that the divorce rate is not only 50%. I'll play some. I'll play a clip right now. He says it's closer to seventy-five percent when you roll in the uh, uh, cheaper to keeper men, who are men that want to divorce their wives but don't end up doing it. They're being absolutely lied to about this rate. Listen to this clip. This guy makes me mad. Nomen as Domen. Marriage can be successful, of course. It's just not something that's as scalable as we as a society are trying to pretend it is. Marriage Mary. is, and I've said this a hundred times, and I'll say it a hundred more. Marriage is like the lottery. You are probably not going to win, okay? You're probably not going to win. Don't make that your 401k. You're probably <laughs> not going to win. But if you win, what you win is so great that I don't blame you for buying a ticket and trying. I personally don't buy lottery tickets. But when somebody says, yeah, I played a lottery, hey, man, somebody's got to win. And you know what? As long as you're not blowing money that you need for food or to put shoes on your kid's feet, you're not hurting anybody, go out, give it a try. So I always tell people, listen, marriage, when it works, when you have somebody who's married 20 plus years and they're still crazy about each other, that is the exception, not the rule. But when you do it, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. So why not buy the ticket, take the ride, but have a prenup? Wear a seatbelt, guys. You can be a safe driver, but wear a seatbelt. So it happens. This, this, and Matt Walsh gives a really good response to this. This dipshit doesn't even realize that marriage is so informative of all of our basic leitmotifs and images that he says, well, don't bet on this marriage ticket if it means you're doing so to the cost of putting shoes on your kid's feet. What? He, he can't help himself. Marriage is such a fixture in Western civilization that this other image we normally use, putting shoes on your kid's feet, comes from marriage and he's trying to equate it to irresponsibly playing the lottery it's a uh reductio ad absurdum so uh, it's very frustrating that this this is i think the same guy i heard on a rollo tomasi panel kicking the number to 75 percent. it's an outright lie and it will i don't know how you're getting 15 out of a thousand fail uh, but but uh it's definitely not 75 percent. how are you getting the 15 out of a thousand so that one is from the Institute of Family Studies. I'll put the link into the description. They had an article recently about how the divorce rates are all time low in the US. So that is whether it's the rate is different from some of the stat that these guys are throwing around, but 75% just sounds wildly out of line. It might well be exactly what Sol's describing there with the different ways of comparing divorces to marriages. So, Tim, good point there. And Nick, you're a young guy. What are your thoughts about this? You see the doom and gloom around you. You've got Elliot telling you be countercultural. Tim pointing out how the red pill and feminism have come full circle on this topic. What kind of thoughts are on your mind? It just reminds me of the quote, there's three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Hmm. Uh to go from 75% to 15 out of a thousand, which if, unless I'm absolutely failing at math is one and a half percent. Um, it's kind of funny th that you can just apply two different perspectives to stats and then just spin a narrative however you want and convince your cohort of people to do the thing that you want them to do. You know, I, I read the rational mail by Rolo Tomasi about five years ago. I remember reading it on my parents' couch and just my mind being blown by uh, specifically his chapter on sexual marketplace value and 
how how men's SMV peaks at 30 and women's peaks at you know 22 or something. And so, really, what I had to do was spend the next decade of my life getting as rich and ripped and powerful as I possibly could, and then go lurk at a college campus or something, or go on Tinder and find some impressionable 20 year old whose SMV is the highest, and I will have solved my problem. And then what I would, what, if I was a, a rational male, what I would do is I would spin plates as many as possible. I would have multiple girlfriends that I was dating at the same time. And if in a very bizarre turn of events, I found perhaps one woman who may have been acceptable to me, I would sign a prenup and then marry her. Um, I don't know if people know, Rolo is married with two daughters. So there's a bit of irony there. Also, his name's not Rolo. I won't say what his real name is, but I encourage people to do some digging on on that and perhaps why he might have some motivations for saying the things that he's saying. Um, luckily, I have a countercultural streak in me like Elliot does, but also luckily I I spent enough time with the right people that I realized today that being countercultural is getting married and having that marriage succeed because for a long time I thought being countercultural was oh, pff, I'm not going to get married. I'm going to go to Thailand, you know, like, like all these red pill guys for some reason end up in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies yeah, I don't know tonight. why that might be. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Rolo is the guy, if you put his name in Google, the first thing you'll see is a, someone who looks like an, a 1990s backup dancer. That's him. So don't get confused when you put the name in. He's got a beanie on and uh, often in a vest. So, Nick, you're right with how you described that book blowing your mind. The thing is, though, that were you also told for that decade from age 20 to age 30 not to have sex? Or was that a decade of sleeping around? Right. So at the time, you know, I was I was an atheist. And so it happened to... Uh, perfectly coincide with the the carnal desires of oh just you know just do whatever you want um, because you're just plate spinning and this is it was also supposed to be a period of time where um, a lot of you know Rollo was correct about the gynocentricity of society today there was enough truth in that book that it did it did have an impact on my mind um, it just would have been. I mean, Tim hadn't written it yet, but it would have been a lot better to get the the drafts of Case for Patriarchy, um, you know, in when I was twenty years old than than that book. But yeah, the um, I, I, another issue I take with this this statistical analysis is there. Let's say we take the the average between this 1.5% and 75%, and we'll call it like roughly 50%, uh, 40, 40% of marriages fail. It, it reminds me of epidemiological studies that were done with red meat, where they said red meat causes cancer. And then you're like, oh no, well, how do you know this? And they're like, well, we asked 500,000 people to fill out this, this form about the last decade of how much they think they ate red meat each week. And then we compared that with how many of them had cancer. And what we saw was there was a relative statistical correlation. And you're like, you're telling me this is the science that's telling me red meat causes cancer. How much of that red meat was a grass fed, grass finished cow from three miles up the road here in Florida? And how much of that was a McDouble? and how many of those people were smokers and how many of those people exercise and all these things. So I don't give a shit if it's 99% of marriages fail, how many of those people were practicing Catholics? How many of those men didn't watch porn? How many of those women had fathers that were in the homes? And then you start to realize that like, yeah, statistics kind of don't matter if you filter correctly, if you just have like a good orienting reflex. Yeah, that's such a good point. The one of the top reasons for divorce is the wife out earning the husband. And you could even argue, look, if you've got your wife working, then you're not really married in the sense in which we're talking about the model of marriage that we're promoting on CMASC as being patriarchal. How many people who are living that out get divorced? So that's a really good comparison to make, Nick. On the stats point, 
the second lie men are being told is that most women are unmarried. But Sol points out that the way this was arrived at is that they defined women as any female over 16. So we're including 17 year old girls here. They also included widows. They included women with husbands serving abroad or in prison. So counting them as unmarried too. And that's how they ended up with the uh, red pill 51% to inspire doom and gloom. All but husbands are serving abroad. Well, they're wives. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. You've got to watch out for Tim today. He's got the most the mustache on. He means business. So, but even when Look you count out. girls, even when you count girls as young as 16, only 25% of women have never married. Now, this is a good thing to know as a young man because women are interested in marriage still. You're told that they're not and they just want to have party life, hot girl summer, etc. But on Instagram, I speak to quite a lot of women in the comments who are saying, I'm just looking for a man to marry. I'm not interested in all of this degenerate culture. I know it's bad for me. I'm sick of feminism. And they don't know that there are also guys out there thinking the same thing. Don't want to get involved just looking for a woman, but they're just crossing paths, which is why we've set up return matchmaking so those people can find each other and it works and we deal with them every day. But when you're told as a young man, look, most women never marry. It's not something that's in their heart. They don't care. It's not a priority. Then you just think, what's the point? Elliot, you got young daughters. Does this concern you? It concerns me that this is the cultural narrative and that they're living in a world where other people think that, especially the men that may potentially be their husbands. But I'm also, you know, I, I come from a long line of married people, <laughs> right? Like my grandparents, my parents, their parents. So my children know what a good marriage looks like. They know that marriage can last. They know that marriage is a good thing. So, you know, I always say that I'm kind of fighting the culture in a way, but I think the home always wins in the end because there's also, you know, living day in and day out in an environment where they can see, taste and touch the fruits of marriage. So I, I, I'm not so worried, especially, you know, now they're a bit older, right? Like when they were at their most impressionable, like, you know, 12, 13, 14, especially as, as little girls, uh, I had to do a lot of re-educating because they were getting hold of YouTube videos and TikToks that were teaching them all kind of feminist stuff. Uh, luckily, or, you know, by the grace of God, I was there and I put a stop to it as best I could during the time. And it, so there were some was, there were some struggles, you know, they were like trying to convince them that like TikTok is wrong, right? Your, your, your parent, your friend's parents have shitty lives. Just look. Now they're in their late teens and my wife and I are their heroes. We're, I, I, I don't know how many parents can say that, but I'm just so happy that my daughters get my wife as their role model. They look at me and their other as a, an example. Like, like my oldest daughter the other day, that was a couple of months ago, but she said it in a, I guess, uh, Gen X way. She's, she looked at my wife and I just speaking with each other and, and being kind to one another. And she goes, oh, marriage goals. And like to hear my daughters looking at us and saying that, uh, just puts me in, a, in an optim, optimistic and hopeful place that uh, we're raising them in a way that's going to make the world better. I, I know this sounds crazy to this gynocentric world, but like I'm not raising my daughters to be CEOs. I'm not raising my, although two of my daughters have extraordinary athletic capacity because of my genes, uh, I'm not raising them to be power lifters or professional athletes or anything with that. And if they ask me or anybody asked me, or even if they ask my daughters, they may get the same answer from them that they're being raised to be wives. <laughs> they're being raised to be mothers, good wives and good mothers. 
once again, the thing that that challenges me the most is, you know, are there fathers raising their sons in this generation in the same way, such that my daughters can find a good match, a worthy, a worthy match in a man? Yep, there certainly are. We got two of them on the panel with you with the same concerns. And look, I think what you described there is one of the, the main ways in which masculine fathers today can change the culture is bringing up girls who want to be stay at home wives and mothers and to continue what they've seen in their parents marriages again from the institute of family studies people most likely to cheat you've got people who don't come from intact families themselves and people who don't attend religious services regularly and more broadly speaking men are slightly more likely to cheat than women are so when you take those three things into account, you can see how important what you're doing is. It's, uh, if I could jump in, Will, it's yeah. clever. The The efficacy of that stat at first, when you said it, I was confused. It's like, why, does, why is that supposed to be a spooky statistic that you know, more than half of women aren't married? And then I realized what you were saying there, that it's, it's to try and inspire young men that they don't even want it. That like one out of every two women is going to go to the end of their life being like, yeah, I don't really care. Um, and in, in the case for patriarchy, Tim talks about supply side versus demand side, uh, and, and what they're messing with on that. And this is one of the, one of the weird instances where the supply actually influences the demand, you know, like if, if you have more um, daughter Hulses in the world and daughter Gordons and daughter Nolans, guys will move fucking mountains to be a man worthy of you know knocking on your door. I know, I know, it's not t typically in the Christian tradition to ask for the father's hand in marriage, but even to just to sit at the dinner table with you guys uh, is they would move mountains to do that. So it. It clicked in my head because of because of that chapter in Tim's book that yeah, if you mess with the the perception of the supply, you're absolutely going to impact the demand. Hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's an old expression from Reaganomics, which I know got out of fashion, but it's true. Supply creates its own demand, Nick. It's it's a fact of the universe, and that is why they're telling that lie. I I ignored it too, and I guess that's why I thought it was. I always thought it was queer, uh, odd that the red pill was always out there saying that, oh, women don't want to get married. And obviously, we, uh, uh, three of us who run the return matchmaking, we just know that's not true. That's all these girls want. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the stats are very, very, very susceptible of manipulation here. Sorry, I, could, I, could I play another Matt Walsh quote? I thought his response to... The uh, statistic mongering of feminists and red pill people against marriage was perfect because he says it doesn't matter what the divorce rate it is. It's not a deterministic account. You can affect your own outcome. This is not like other statistics where you can't affect your own outcome. L listen to this. I thought it was great. It falls apart anyway, and that happens, and it's terrible, but it happens. It's also true that there are many, many things you can do in your marriage and before your marriage to make it much more secure than the average. Obvious things. Like you can marry someone who shares your same fundamental values. Not everyone does that. In fact, a lot of people don't. A lot of people go into marriages knowing ahead of time that they're marrying someone who doesn't share their fundamental values. Their, mm -hmm. their, their chances of divorce are going to be somewhere much higher than yours if you don't make that basic entry-level mistake that they have made. You can do other things. Like you can state from the outset that you both in principle don't believe in divorce and won't consider it as a viable option for solving any marital difficulties you may experience down the line. You can have a strong and shared faith. You can establish from the beginning a habit of honest communication. You can make time for each other. You can continue to date, even or especially as your lives get busier, you start having kids and so on. You can make a strong effort to be patient with and grateful to each other. You can take care of your body and your appearance. You can do all these things and more. Now, I'm not saying that if you do all of this, it will bring your divorce chance down to zero. I'm not denying that there are plenty of people out there who, who did all this, at least on their own end, and you still ended up divorced. That's not my point. My point is that the divorce rate doesn't take any of that into account. The people who take none of these basic steps are lumped in with the people who do all of it, and we're supposed to believe that both groups have an equal chance of marital failure. That's just not true. 
well said by Walsh. Mm. Anyway, I, I wanted to get that mm. in there. Yeah, if you do cool. all those things, if you if somebody if a couple did all of those things, I would have to imagine that the percentage when expressed as an integer of divorces is zero percent. I can't imagine you would do all those things and it was even even close to one percent. Right. He just he just listed everything and asked your husband. It like it's like you're telling me if you do all of those things, twenty years in you guys are gonna go, you know what? Screw it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is zero. Yeah. Yeah. That that's what the, it, as an integer, it's zero. It's point point oh oh one. Cause it would be one of you would have to be a schizophrenic to be both of you doing all those yeah. things for twenty years and then to get left. Like a committed to the act. <laughs> Right. And right. So much of this is there in the wisdom of the teaching of the church as well, because human nature never changes. And when you're dealing with it in the way the church does for thousands of years, you realize things. And that's why I've forgotten which one it was. Uh, there was a bishop who said in the 20th century, it was uh, a mixed marriage begins with a spiritual divorce these things about clashing values, they were always taught to people. But it turns out when you try to invent your own model of marriage or try to do it without even considering it as a sacrament, without doing it with God's grace, then it turns out you run into difficulties. Surprise, who would have thought it? Now, talking about human nature, we've got our third point, which I think is really what the red pill is building up to by trying to tell people that you can't make marriage work. The, the claim is that monogamy isn't natural. And there's a funny way of talking about what natural means here, because yes, you can look at the fact that 80% of the world's societies have in fact been polygonous, multiple wives. Why? Human beings are prone to, to lust and to greed. And the guys who are the, the big, the powerful, the wealthy ones, the warriors, they want to hoard women to themselves. However, that doesn't mean that it fits human nature best. You have murder. You have all kinds of crime throughout history in all societies. We don't go around saying it's natural. The earliest hunter-gatherer humans were strictly monogamous, and monogamy has produced all the world's most successful empires because, in fact, it is the way in which human, human nature flourishes best. Um, Aquinas says that, human nature resists a promiscuous union of the sexes. Now, if that weren't the case, isn't it odd that the sexual revolution is turning out to be pretty disastrous socially? Aquinas is exactly right. Monogamy is what matches human nature, our rational nature, best. So to tell young guys, oh, look, this king in the past, or Genghis Khan, for example, he wasn't monogamous, so you shouldn't be. That is a sleight of hand. You've noticed this, right? Elliot, you know it works. It, it works. Yeah, on young guys and it's too. silly on three different fronts. You know, one of the um, one of the arguments that Jack Donovan makes, you know, and make of Jack whatever you will, he makes some great points in his book Way of Man. Is this whole tendency in our culture through other popular books? Uh, say that we are, it's it's natural for us to be promiscuous, and it mirrors our primate ancestors. This is what they say, right? And uh, in in one popular book, I, I think it's, it's I can't remember the name of it, but he speaks of how human beings are more like bonobos in our nature. Uh, it, it, you know, if if these are really our ancestors more like bonobos than the previously thought chimp. And then you got red pill guys out here, you know, promoting this book. And what Jack points out is that bonobo society revolves around the woman, first of all, and that the female, and it's because there's plenty of food, right? There's a lot of plenty. So the men don't really need to do anything because, well, I mean, all of our needs are being met. And so as a result, the bonobo spends most of his time masturbating and, uh, and actually uh, having pleasure in watching and maybe even jerking off to the lesbian bonobos having sex with one another. 
And so it, <laughs> he calls it, so what Jack calls us is the bonobo masturbation culture. Because like the bonobo, we have so, we're so decadent. We have so much available to us. Men are so bored because every women wish is delivered instantly that we do act like bonobos. And this, and this propaganda is pushed. But, you know, I thought of that because you brought up the chimp, or at least I thought you would brought it up. But this idea that when we were a, a, a hunting culture, a gathering culture, like when we actually have to go out there and work for what we need and we behave in a way that uh, that takes advantage of our gifts as men, you know, strength and and, and the ability to, to, to work and get things done physically. I'm not just talking about, you know, typing keys on a computer, get out, that we naturally fall into a patriarchal order like the chimp. And in the chimp's environment, first of all, as opposed to the bonobo, the bonobo has uh, plentiful food because he's, he eats plants. He's sort of a, um, he's a vegetarian or a vegan, but like the chimp, we thrive best on meat. And that means that they had to go out and they had to hunt. And so it's a bit scarce. They had to work harder, right? They didn't, they didn't eat prepackaged uh, processed foods out of little baggies that uh, that, that live forever in the cabinets. <laughs> they had to go out there and they had to kill fresh meat. And as a result, the women <laughs> had to depend on the men. The women, uh, had, because they couldn't do it, they couldn't get the food, right? There was no, there was no Burger King. They had to depend on the men. And thus, the patriarchal order uh, unfolded. And I, I don't, you know, I want to say as, ter- as far as natural, right, is concerned, these, the, 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 the bonobos, they, dads never knew who their children were. They were out there you know, having sex and they really didn't, weren't even concerned. The chimp, like they were very protective over their women. Their women weren't treated like a commodity. They were treated like a prize. So the women were sub- subservient, the females were subservient to men because men actually had to go out there and work. Uh, but at the same time, they were treated better. They were tr- they were they were more highly prized. They didn't they didn't just share their females with uh, with one another or different tribes, unlike we have today. So anyway, as far as you know, the whole the whole natural um, argument goes, it blows up in our face, especially if we want to consider what's more con- con- congenial to masculinity. Do we want to be masturbating bonobos? <laughs> or do we want to be bloodthirsty, patriarchal, badass chimps <laughs> that value our women? And I think women, it would be good for women to agree with that. Too. I would imagine women would agree with that too. There's a lot of truth in that. Donovan has some good things in his book. He's got some bad things as well. There's another video on my channel called The Way is Gay, which is a review of Donovan's book explaining what he gets wrong. But there's plenty in there that we can roll with uh, from the C-Mask set of values that we promote. Elliot, that's a really good comparison, though, because uh, the sexual revolution basically just flooded the marketplace with sex. That was the plan. Promote promiscuity to lower the value of it. Women know this. They call women who give sex away easily cheap because it undermines the going rate, which used to be marriage. The bar was that if you want sex with me, you've got to commit to me, be married to me, value me. And feminism was so powerful because it got the market flooded. So men don't value it. Women don't value themselves either. And it's that environment of degeneracy and softness that damages us in the way you describe. Now, we're talking then about how monogamy fits human nature best. That is best for the family, best for children, really, which is what sex is all about, ultimately. If you're thinking about it as a transaction between men and women getting stuff from each other, which Rolo's sexual marketplace value can lead you to do, you're actually forgetting the point of sex, the point of marriage is children fundamentally. This is why monogamy is so important. They also will try and say that multiple wives is Christian. Tim, there's so many accounts you can look at online, Twitter, Instagram, saying that multiple wives in the old testament this is true christianity and monogamy is like a cucked feminist version of it and we need to go back to being old testament patriarchal kings with as many wives as we want 
What's the response to this? Well, at the most, one could accurately say it's it's Jewish in the sense of like the Pentateuch up until you know some some time toward the end of the Pentateuch because a Abram did have multiple wives. Uh, it's not accurate at all to say about Christians because, as Thomas Aquinas says, it to have multiple wives for one man violates the natural law in one sense, but it doesn't in another sense. Uh, Thomas says he, he has to say that because nothing that Abram does that was sanctioned by God could strictly violate the natural law. But it was just as it was the hardness of the Israelite heart that Jesus said made God allow or con compelled God to allow Jewish divorce. Now in the Christian order, it's not allowed at all. You could say it's the hardness of the Israelite heart that made them allowed to be indulged with this you can't call it a boon, but with this extra, extra wives. For Christians, however, as Thomas Aquinas says, whether or not multiple wives for one man is a violation of the natural law, part yes, part no, the supernatural law brought with Christ and the elevation, to quote the catechism, of um, natural marriage to sacramental marriage to, to give it extra dignity, as the catechism of the Catholic Church says, means that the supernatural law now, no, for any Christian, does not acknowledge any dignity in uh, polygamy. I, so there's, there's that thing. I'd, I'd also like to just go back and address really quickly uh, what you asked Elliot about this misdefinition of natural thrown at marriage by feminists, red pill, and Will, as you know from, early, from yesterday, before that, of the video we did, on marital sexual ethics, you also get a misdefinition by natural thrown at it by the turbo rigorists uh, uh, and um, among certain low information tradcaths. They're all defining natural incorrectly. The degenerate people like like the red pill and feminists will always misdefine natural as any inclination a thing has toward some tendency. The, uh, the turbo rigorous within Roman Catholicism will, on the opposite extreme, say that it, it is behavior which corresponds with the primary end of a thing only, never the secondary ends. What the true Aristotelian definition of natural is, why it is natural for men to be married to just one woman, it's not counter-natural, is it's whatever... Ma most efficiently maximizes the potency of a thing qua that thing, uh, what, what enables that thing to be that thing the most. Whether or not that's easy or a struggle has much to do with the concupiscent will and intellect of the individual member of whatever species you're talking about. Uh, here I'm talking about humans because animals can't be concupiscent. But the point is, just because 40% of Americans are obese, close to 50%, it's probably about the same as the divorce rate, right? Mm -hmm. Walsh says the divorce rate's 35% of, since time immemorial, people have said 50. We're saying it's lower than that. It's about that. The, the obesity rate's 40%. This is not at all natural for the metabolic systems of animals, let alone the human being. What's most natural is for them to function efficiency, efficiently. This is the, the function argument. And when they function efficiently, uh, someone should look fit and if not strong, at least thin. But 40% of people do it. Does this mean it's an easy pitfall? Yes, easy pitfalls don't equate to natural. So it, it works the other way as well in reverse, that if um, it might be difficult to keep a really, really good marriage together. And maybe it always has been. That doesn't mean it's unnatural also. It is what maximizes the potency, not only of children, which are the, the point of marriage, but the secondary purpose of marriage is it makes the man under the sacramental marriage a better man. It makes the wife under sacramental marriage a better woman, and it gets man, woman, and child to heaven. And natural. Because it makes men strong in exactly the way you're describing. Think about even the etymological connection between virtue, virility, strength. Because it makes men strong, because it makes us flourish, that's why the enemies of men don't want men getting married. It's a great yes. 
outline, Tim. It's really important people get those terms straight. Coming back to the point about Christianity being what Christ taught, ultimately. Pope Leo XIII said that Christ brought back matrimony to the nobility of its primeval origin. Remember, God made Adam one wife, Eve, not multiple. Brought back matrimony to the nobility of its primeval origin by condemning the customs of the Jews in their abuse of the plurality of wives. Christ said that marriage is two, not three or more, becoming one flesh. And also, red pill guys, these people you're looking up to as models, they were married. Multiple wives is still marriage. So even then, it doesn't make sense. What you're talking about is actually zero wives and just spinning plates with lots of side chicks. They were still married. So that's actually for us, not for you. You can't have that example. It works for the sea mask side of things better than it does for yours. Number five, it's the 21st century, bro. Sex has changed. Marriage is an old-fashioned thing from the past, and we need to move on because now something about human nature is different. We don't need it anymore. The response to this is nice and quick. Human nature and the rules of sex are timeless. We don't get to invent them. We can bump up against them. We can pretend we can break them and then find out the hard way why they matter. But we're never going to change the fact that sex still makes children. Children need stable marriages. So what's true isn't new and what's new isn't true. Nick, you know it in your head there. It's a common thing around in the culture that we can get along without marriage now. But it seems like we're finding out that that's wrong. I'm just nodding my head because I, d I do remember five years ago discovering these red pill ideas and thinking like, you know, maybe I'm just not going to get married. You know, maybe this is the way forward. So it's just, I'm chuckling to myself that, uh, <laughs> and grateful that I've come full circle. <laughs> yeah. You, th you're not, uh, you're a rational animal. You're not a brute animal. You're not like a bull that can just frolic in a field, and never get married and impregnate all the calves. That isn't how human nature works. Is it Tim? Yeah, Boethius has a great quote exactly on the bull. He says, um, man has a higher nature and the animals have a lower nature. And he's talking about uh, intemperance, specifically touch, not taste. And when man sinks to the level of the bull or the ox, he doesn't just he doesn't simply sink to the, the ox's level. He actually sinks far below because for the ox to be lower and subrational is natural for the thing. This illustrates the point I just made. But for man, since his nature is to be higher, to be rational, to sink to the lower level of an ox is far below that of the actual ox who below who belongs there. And I, I but butchered the quote, but but it's exactly right. If we try to emulate animals, we don't only sink to their level. Oh, you're acting like an animal. We sink far below. That's the great and oft overlooked Boethius. Exactly. Well, it's funny to me that when the secular right or whatever you want to call what the red pill community is looked at the problem of gynocentrism, the solution they came up with was inject more women into the system, into your system. <laughs> yeah. Specifically speaking, get as many women as you can to... Uh, be beholden to or listen like you know interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and i just think it's funny that you know you you really think that you're going to solve what you perceive to be the ills of the world and what what uh you crave as a young man or as a man in general that what you crave and, and the solution to this is like five women instead of one wife and that's just not self-knowledge you don't know you really are confused about yourself because one thing that did protect me from uh, the <laughs> it's, I guess it's, it's twofold. One thing that protected me from that trajectory um, is sort of the same thing that when, you know, when a guy's like, you know, I don't want to take steroids cause I don't want to get too big. It's like, buddy, you're not going to get too big. Trust me. That's not you. You're not Arnold. You're not Mike Metzner. So, this idea of like, well, I don't want to do the the 
plate spinning thing because i'm just going to be drowning in women no you're not no you're not don't worry uh, but secondarily i just knew myself enough and i knew my heart and my heart was like i just need to know one woman that's that is what i crave is just that intimate connection with one woman and i think if any of these red pill guys took like a 10 second audit of their heart they would realize that what they're trying to make up for a number really can be achieved with like a quality of, of one. Yep. Yep. And there are first principles which govern that one-on-one -on -one relationship, even to non-Christians, their natural first principles that necessitate it be one. This is what I don't get about even the natural elements of polygamy in the old, old, old Testament that Thomas says might not violate the natural law. Um, yeah, the bounds of loyalty, even in friendship, it's really hard to have more than one best friend, uh, you know, uh, platonically. It's definitely impossible, whereas it might be hard to have a, a male best friend that's to have multiple of those. It's impossible, given the nature of what romance is. You're my only one. You know, think of, all, of candy hearts on a really basic level. Only have eyes for you. You know, be mine. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing inherently, and people get this even if they're not Christian. Doesn't Rollo have a doctrine of like keeping his wife in dread, which is why he surrounds yeah. himself with naked women in Las Vegas there? I mean, what a shitty yeah. fucking thing to do, you know? It's like that's that's just shitty. I look, You don't have to be a Christian to be like, wow, man. that If you have to like game your wife with all these manipulative – uh, uh, preordained tactics, not alpha. How about a wife that loves you because you're a mensch and wants to do your bidding um, because she admires you and because you treat her well? I, I, to me, that should be enough if you're really an alpha. that what, what a pathetic, shitty gamma technique to keep your wife in suspense that you might do something horrible. Yeah, I might not feed you. I might quit my job and go crazy. Yeah. Like, ooh, alpha, bro. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Yeah. I guess it's to do with the whole model of what they think the human person is. We got this super chat on here saying that Red Pill believes Evo Psych rules all. And you've got a completely different philosophical framework for thinking about what a human being is and what's good for a human being entailed by that. Um, Let's say, though, that someone's thinking, OK, I like what you guys have said so far. I just don't believe I can find a good woman out there. This is the sixth myth we're looking at, the sixth lie told to really break men's hearts and black pill them about marriage. But Aaron Wren has noted that if you look at the stats, it's definitely possible to marry a woman whose statistical correlates with divorce are 10 percent or less. You can find a virgin, you can find a religious woman, you can find her in her early 20s, and you cannot cohabitate before you get married. Elliot, you got a massive audience and deal with young men every day. How does this I can't find a good woman lie factor into their decisions about life? I think entitlement has a lot to do with it. You know, we live in this world where everybody gets a trophy for showing up. Right. This, I like to call it the mommy culture, mommy centric culture, where like you deserve to be loved just because you are. Right. And that's also a part of the centric mindset that men have adopted as well. Like women are loved what they are. Right. I had to explain this to my son today. You know, you, you have three sisters. They get a pass. They get a pass because of another P word that they possess. And you don't have that. And so you're not entitled the way that they may be to being treated nicely or uh, getting things as a result. You're a man. You're not entitled to anything but your opportunity to try. And I don't think these guys are trying at all because, well, they got a trophy for showing up. And so I think, you know, I remember this kid, Elliot Roger, who I, I think he, he killed some women or did some bad stuff because he was a young man who felt entitled to women and their sex. And I, you know, I, I just think of this because there were some videos that came out recently with him, like complaining about why won't women pay attention to me? And I like, he deserves something. And that's really the mindset. And if you feel entitled, well, then why try? And that means 
I can be a total slapdick. That means, no, I, I don't have to make my bed. I don't have to lose weight. I don't need to make money. I don't need to learn manners or know how to carry myself in a dignified way. No, I don't have to have the integrity that makes my word my bond. I don't have to be manly in any way, shape, or form. Well, especially because I can quench the thirst with pornography, with, with prostitution, with OnlyFans. Like, I mean, it extends... It, far into like every aspect of a man's world like i don't actually need to be a warrior in order to turn on a video game that allows me to have a helmet and a, and a and a gun another thing i was trying to explain to my son i was like you're not that guy that you're watching in the video screen no matter what it might give you the sense of that but there are men that actually live up to that and they deserve the honor they deserve the nobility and the valor you don't deserve a woman, if you're complaining that there aren't any good women out there, how about become a good man? How about how about how about take it as a area of study of mastery? What does it take to be a man that's worthy of good women? No, they just because you are doesn't mean you should get. This is a, an area in which you've got to work. And until that mindset is adopted, these guys are going to, it's funny, I saw a meme the other day. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, like these cartoon memes. And it was a guy, it said, uh, guy says, she used to be bad in high school, but she fell off. Meaning she was in high school, but she fell off. And then like below it says the guy, and it showed a picture of like a complete slap dick. I, uh, he just looked like he was out of shape. He was just ugly. You could tell he wasn't a high achiever. These guys have all kinds of opinion about women and how they're not living up to what their pornographic standards are. But these guys are losers. So you got to clean yourself up first, fellas. Yeah, that's good advice. So when you prepare yourself for that opportunity, you'll find you're ready when it comes along. But if you're not ready, then you won't be able to take advantage of it. The next myth I want to get into is we can deal with it really quickly. It's just flat out wrong. 17 women in history have reproduced for every one man. You hear that thrown around a lot in the red pill sphere. I think they're trying to say that this proves that monogamy isn't natural. But if you look up the actual stats on this from the study of genetics, two women have reproduced for every one man. But that doesn't mean that most men had multiple wives. Many men died in combat before they ever got the chance to impregnate a woman or died hunting large animals, died from weather scenarios, etc. Men live more dangerous lives. So that's the reason for that one. Number eight is men never ask for feminism. There's this victim narrative that it's something that has been foisted on men and they aren't involved in whatsoever. But when you look at thinkers like Marx, Engels, Wilhelm Reich, Herbert Marcuse, we actually see that men were very much behind feminism. Men who were the enemies of the family and want to fragment, fragment the social order to bring about what they see as the utopian revolution. And we push this point hard on CMASK because it's so fundamental that men understand it. If you are a male fornicator, you are doing exactly what those male feminist theorists wanted you to do to bring about the change they wanted to see in society. So building on Elliot's point there, men need to recognize the feminism in themselves, take the lead there before they start complaining about it in the women around them. Nick, what do you think about this? We're just not yet at the point where saying no results in a bullet in the head. So there's kind of no excuse up until that day, up until the day when you're in prison because you offended a woman. Just say, just say no. And the, the most red pill experience that I've ever had as a young guy was not political. It was not religious. It was feminism. I was just telling my buddy this last night. This is the most kinetic, worthwhile investigation that I have ever done because every bit of disposition and, and personality that I have has been crafted 
by the feminine society, by the matriarchal society. My speech, my fit, this is much different today than it was five years ago, but just speaking broadly, my speech, my humor, the things I'm willing to say, not say, pursue, people I'm willing to hang out with, how confrontational I will be with other male friends, what boundaries that I set for myself. And I guarantee you, I'm not the only guy out there like this. And this, this process of awakening like every single day and realizing like, wait, you're telling me all I had to do was not tolerate it? I had all of the power and that nobody was going to kick down my door and throw me in prison. So yeah, it's, I, I also had this sort of conversation as well with respect to uh, the state of the world slash country. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who want to blame certain uh, people who are more familiar with the old Testament than the new I've learned my lesson. Will uh, and, I said, yeah, but like, it's your fault. It's our fault because at no point was it a gun in your face saying, take this deal. It was an offer and we picked wrong every time for a couple thousand years. And here we are like, whether it was Seneca falls or even just internet pornography itself, like they said, Hey, do you want internet porn? And everyone was like, yeah, okay. And the, and the people who said no, didn't say no well enough and their cohorts weren't strong enough. And if it, and if they failed, it was because there was a century before them of failures. So just, yeah, it's, it should be the most empowering message that a young guy has. Like you, you have 100% of the capacity to put the train in the other direction. Yeah, that's it. If you're willing to take on the challenge, if you're effeminate and you want to abdicate, authority and walk away from that because it looks too tough then don't be surprised if feminism walks all over you because that's what it's testing it wants to find out if it can push you over it's like the biggest shit test there's ever been in the whole of human history and what are you going to do about it as a young man now we're told that christianity is feminist as well tim and this is the thing that you write about What's the elevator pitch for why Christianity isn't feminist? That no pope or no passage of scripture or none of the fathers or none of the scholastics or none of the serious people that ever thought or wrote about Christianity were feminists, that Jesus picked an all male clerical patriarchy, that St. Paul in Holy Writ said that there's a, a lower lay patriarchy that's exclusively male that men are the lords of the household that women are to obey men uh as as if men are their lords that saint paul and holy writ say that women are to keep quiet that they're not allowed to ever teach a man or have any authority over a man that man is the glory of god that woman is the glory of man that i mean do i need to keep going <laughs> there's just not one corpuscle in the entire tattered shred of Christianity, if we look through history, even as a palimpsest, where things are added and taken away, there is not one meaningful scintilla of evidence that Christianity is feminist. Christianity is patriarchal. We have a bifurcated patriarchy, clerical patriarchy on top that is all male, uh, the apostolic Fathers are the bishops, all male. The priests are all male. The, di the deacons are all male for another week or so. We'll see what happens at the synod. And then this, the lower, the lower uh, stratum is an all-male patriarchy, that men are charged as priest, prophet, king of the home. Their wives have no authority over them. They must obey them on all things. This is not just from Jesus's or St. Paul's misogynistic day, the way feminists said before I wrote my book, because eight 20th century popes renewed this absolute teaching of the absolute dominion of men over women in the household. It's, it's one husband over one wife. That's why we're affirmers of patriarchy, not all men over all women. I don't tell your guys' wives what to do. I, I couldn't. But I tell my wife what to do, and she's, we get along great. We always have. But um, that's the way patriarchy works. It only works with Christianity and Christianity only works with the lay patriarch and a, and a 
clerical patriarchy. So I don't know what are the what are the counts accounts of uh, Christian feminism well that 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 um, accrue against this case. Do you know of any? I don't know of any aside from no, lies. None that makes sense to me. What we were hearing about from Elia earlier with how he's raising his daughters is what men are supposed to do. Titus 2, 4 to 5, train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Problem is, that's tough for fathers to do. And men have fallen short of the standard that Christianity sets. So we mustn't confuse those two things, the way in which men have fallen short of the standard and what the standard actually is. Christianity is patriarchy, as Tim just outlined beautifully for us. Now we've got a couple of the lies left to get through, so let's get into them. Masculinity is promiscuity. You know, a true alpha has lots of women on the go at once. Well, the red pill dilemma, as I like to call it on this one, is that at no point in human history do alpha males allow their daughters to be spinning plates. They don't say, oh yeah, yeah, that's alpha, bro. T take, take my daughter. And also all these men had multiple wives, so they were married. What does promiscuity get us now, played out to the maximum? Where can we see it to its fullest effect? In the ghetto, the way in which masculinity has been replaced with machismo, the gangster who has no wives, doesn't care about his kids, just leaving a wake of destruction behind him, he ends up emasculated in this broken society. So if the red pill is supposed to be a praxeology, just something that works, a set of ideas that work, well, how come when we play it out to its fullest, we see it breaking down most? It really doesn't work. It brings you a broken society, which is why promiscuity was promoted. Elliot, you've heard this, right? That a real man is as promiscuous as possible because how could he possibly say no to a woman who's offering herself to him? But true strength is actually about, you might be that guy that lots of women want to be with, but you can say no, because I'm committed to one, because that's what's best for me, for her, and for my family. Yeah, I agree that a man is measured by his self-mastery. Right, his ability to say no, your ability to say yes to every cookie that comes across your plate just makes you obese. Your ability to say no and to eat things that are life affirming and life giving means you'll be lean and fit and strong and healthy. It works the same way with the indulgence in women. Uh, the big difference, obviously is that if you eat nothing but cookies and candy and cupcakes and trash, it's going to show up on your body. It's going to, your people are going to see it. There's no denying it. You could, you know, you, there's these, you ever meet these fat women who pretend like all they eat is salads. And when you, you know, you go and you have, you eat them. I, my wife has friends. And so I'm like, why does bitch act like she only eats eat salads? Every time I write her, she orders a salad. I know that she's eating cupcakes and dung, ding dongs. Well, that's because it shows up all over your body. Like the scarlet letter, if a man was walking around with uh, some indicator that he is a weak man because he can't say no to puss, uh, we would, I'm pretty sure we would, we would change our tune. Also, you know, maybe, maybe I'm going down the wrong rabbit hole because the world over the past you know, two generations has made it as if uh, being this way is somehow virtuous, right? Like... We're, we're, the movies, the, the, the music, the media uh, promotes these ideas. And so you got guys thinking that like they're missing out. They get FOMO if they're not boning a bunch of hoes. And so there's a lot to it. But uh, yeah, I see it. The good thing is I also see it uh, eating itself alive. Feminism, communism, uh, this degeneracy. Uh, it comes to a point where it just it falls apart. And we're at that point where it's falling apart. It's, it's, it's not beautiful to watch a society that was once great come to its knees and, and fall apart. But at the same time, it's also natural, I guess, right? Everything, every year we watch all the leaves fall off the tree. There's just a natural cycle of things. 
And that also means that if the, if the trees are going barren and things are falling apart, that there's a new summertime. There's a new springtime. It's around the corner. Hopefully it will be, you know, my children, children's children, maybe the next generation. They'll get to see the, they'll, they'll have the fruit tree that grows out of the decomposed society that we're rotting in right now. Yep, that's it. Whatever's contrary to human nature isn't going to last in the long run. And that's why the family, why patriarchy always buries its undertakers eventually. And we will see that again. The red pill also convinces men that there's this thing called hypergamy, which is terrible and that we all have to beware of. But all it's really saying is that biologically, what children need determines what women want resources protection and the male body even knows that the man who earns less than his wife is far more likely to suffer erectile dysfunction hypergamy is just about what is good for children so if you're a man who is going to improve himself as the protector as the provider etc you're valued by a woman in a way that you wouldn't be if you'd never bothered to do those things so the simple response to that is not to worry about it. Just focus on being the best man that you can be. And that is going to attract women to you. Last one to look at is the idea that women are built for casual sex. And so are men. We've touched on this before, but they've got biological adaptations to monogamy, like the female orgasm, concealed ovulation. So physically, psychologically, they get discomfort with casual sex. You talk to a woman with a really high body count. Does it make her feel good about herself? Was it a great way to spend her 20s? They say no. We've also got the fact that unlike dogs, for example, or cats, women have continuous sexual receptivity. They're made to be living with one man having sex often throughout the week throughout their whole lives it's not just like a once a month thing where in the jungle the male jaguar just runs into the female one they briefly mate part ways and don't see each other again for months no it's supposed to be daily continuous that's what monogamy really takes advantage of and if men aren't built for monogamy riddle me this one guys why are the red pill gang complaining when men get separated from their children by divorce courts what could possibly be wrong with that if men are just made to pump and dump and ignore their kids it would be natural wouldn't it you think yeah well I'm, I'm not surprised what are they to do with me they were just a brief tingle in the groin i don't care about my kids i pump and dump mm -hmm. instead men get suicidal because men are also built for monogamy the same way that women are it's also the case that the um, DNA of every previous male partner is discoverable in the gray matter of a woman in her brain. Uh, so I have not seen the converse study because women are receivers, not givers. So I've, I've not seen the converse of that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just nonsense to think that uh, uh, you know, Tim's already brought this up with St. Thomas says is with respect to um, men having multiple sexual partners that it, it doesn't violate the natural law, but it violates the divine law or not all of the natural law to correct me if I'm screwing that up there, Tim. Um, but it, there's nothing more evident. I mean, just look at uh, rape culture. Women receive sex in a fundamentally different way you can't compare the two like this. We wouldn't have, and Will, your, your point about <laughs> if it actually was the case that uh, men were built for casual sex, um, every red pill guy would be pro uh, this gynocentric legal system. It would be the greatest thing. You're telling me that I can just write a check every month and never have to think about this again. And really the extent of my fornication is the extent to which I can afford alimony or whatever this is each month, child support payments. Like that sounds like a pretty good deal. Just get a little drop shipping business and like <laughs> you can, you can, and that's exactly, by the way, exactly what Andrew Tate said that he was going to do. He said, I'm going to have 
like 11 or 12 children with multiple different women, not wives, different women. And they're going to be grateful to bear the name Tate. And I'm not going to spend time with them because I'm going to, I'm going to give them money and they're going to go out there into the world and, and, and figure things out for themselves. And you're welcome. You're welcome for your existence. Like, okay, buddy. All right. Sounds yeah. good. I, I tell you something really, uh, not talked about much sexton pointed this out in his book the feminized male the kids of fathers who abscond like that are more likely to end up homosexual it's really interesting so if you get guys doing that not only are you promoting feminist family fragmentation you're also advancing the lgbtq agenda too because the children don't have a strong sense of who they are the sons don't have a strong sense of who they are as men so the guys who think they're behaving the most alpha way are actually helping to bring up the next generation of queers. It's like well, a sick joke, isn't it? In the absence of patriarchy, in the absence of fathers, men and women both overexpress femininity. In the absence of fathers, women become promiscuous, right? They're going to overemphasize their femininity to try and get back what they didn't have in the form of, of a father figure. And then men just turn into women. Mm -hmm. that's it we've covered them all uh we've got a curious comment here from lex superior to finish on it's a shame you changed it from christian masculinity podcast to catholic masculinity podcast well not really because catholicism is christianity everything else is heresy in one form or another so cmask has always been about catholicism and that was our name from the get-go we can talk more about Protestantism in uh, in future episodes, but that's what we're about here. All right, guys, thanks so much for all the comments and insights. It's been a really interesting show and looking forward to the next one. Thanks for the super chats, everybody, and for joining us live. Pleasure to have you here as always. God bless everybody. See you for the next show. Take care. God bless.